I call okay. this meeting to order pursuant to pursuant to chapter 20 of the acts of 2021. This meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via the Amherst the town government website. That's amherstma.gov. No person, no in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means in the event that we are unable to do so for reasons of economic hardship and despite best efforts, we will post on the Amherst town government website once again, www.amherstma.gov. Uh, and also, as I understand it, on the Amherst Town Council, uh, Amherst Government uh, YouTube channel, an audio or video recording, transcript, or other comprehensive recording of proceedings as soon as possible after the meeting. And with that, I call to order the uh, the January 12th, meeting, 2022 meeting of the Amherst Board of Assessors. Excellent. And uh, we are not, uh, excuse me, we are recording the meeting. Um, and so if anyone else is doing so at this time, please notify us now. Okay, hearing none. We can move along okay. with the agenda. Let me, uh, let me see if I can look at the agenda here. Do I have the agenda in front of me? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, let's see. Um, uh, do we have any public participation? No. Does not appear. I we to. do not. No. So let's go to the meetings from. Uh, we have two sets of uh, minutes from prior meetings to address. The first is November tenth, twenty twenty one. I looked at it this morning, and I think whatever corrections I wanted to make. Oh my goodness! What I'm. I'm Sorry, I'm trying to share my screen. I thought it would pop up. What was here. that? <laughs> I thought those were my family pictures there for a minute. <laughs> okay. You're not that young. <laughs> okay. Um, now I've lost um, now I've lost my agenda, but okay. Uh, sorry about that. But you're bringing up the minutes. Okay. There we These go. These are the minutes. Yep. I've got the mm -hmm. agenda up as well. So um, it, we can always pop back to that. Any um, any further concerns about the November 10th, 2021 minutes? I move we approve them. No. Okay, second. second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 That's unanimous. Now we need the, the December meeting minutes. Yes. Um, and uh, addressing these, I'd like to look at the second page, please. I'd like to uh, draw your attention to the fourth um, board board concerned I, that sentence um, didn't make um, instant sense to me so I'm wondering what is intended there board concerned is residents I think it's supposed to say concern board board's, concern. Bo board's yeah. concern is residents that are older and no. have been here for a long time um, and this was would, in in uh, maybe what we should do is put discuss residential exemption down onto the second page. Um, and then yeah. all of this was in connection with that. Okay. I would suggest maybe you make it one concern of the board was that residents, not resident, residents. Residents. The plural of resident. Yeah. Not, not CE, but TS. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and Teresa, do you have these printed so that I, I, I didn't do. put them this time. So, okay, I so do. you can make these notes. Okay, just wanted to make sure we make these these corrections for you. Okay, are we all, so so could you state yeah. that again, Ken, please? I just make that sentence to read one of the concerns of the board is our residents that are older and have been here a long time. Okay. Okay, all right. Always, we had other always, concerns. Yeah. Always concerned about the uh, verb agreement there, whether it's are or is, but... Um, I don't know. You correct me. Know. Yeah. But, and then you have a typo under suggested the following. Ask communities that have residential exemption in place. When was it voted in on, not in voted on it? Okay. 
Uh, Eagle Eye Ken. <laughs> Asking communities that have residential exemption in place, when was it voted on? Is that is that what you want to say? Yeah, instead yeah. of IN, it should be IT. IT. Yeah. Right. Where where are we talking about? I'm sorry. I'm right sorry, at, the at, at the top under top, suggested the following. Yeah. It's the first bullet. Okay. Ask Page communities. Two. And yeah. what's what's wrong in there? I'm sorry. I've got it. I got the in was it voted on. That's yep, the only change. That's it. That's the only okay. change. Okay. And then the other question I had was, did we take any kind of vote or anything about cowls down there? Or did we just discuss it? I believe we just discussed. Um, that was an executive session. So I think, yes, we did do a vote on that one um, in executive session. Okay. Is that, is that and I'm sorry, now I can't see the pay whole page. Is that indicated at the bottom? Yes. Um, it just says discuss. It says discuss chapter land for WD Coles and Richard to be stopping in to sign certificates. Um, and that was just the uh, approval of their continuation of chapter 61 through the forest management plans that were prepared for us. So Ken, I think, is raising a concern that the minutes don't indicate our vote. I thought it was in executive session well i'm a little confused oh yes here. so yes so this was um so we were going to go into executive session we went in at 12 13 and these were the things that we talked about so i think that's probably why it wasn't listed but if you would like it to be we can certainly adjust that well a broader question we've never put executive session minutes in these minutes correct i, I think this change? was Maybe what needed to be done was the executive session entered at, at 12, 13 needed to be after the, oh. the discussion. I, Cause I think what was intended here was for the, what we were talking about in executive session was that as well as personal exemptions. So these are not minutes of the executive session then? Well, well, it has a vote there too. Yeah, we have a vote for the, the, the exemptions. We've always had executive session minutes somewhere else. I don't know yeah. where they are. Yeah, no, I think I think what we need to do is just move um, executive session beneath these two items and okay. um, remove the vote there because it that is correct. It should have been done in the executive session minutes, not these. So we do have separate minutes for executive session? Oh, right, right. Yes. Okay. So then the other question I have is, when do we do personal exemptions in executive session and when we do, do we do them on this open? We thing? never do them in open. We always do uh, personal exemptions in executive session. So are you going to delete this approved personal exemption? Um, we can say that we approve personal exemptions just so that people know what we talked about. Um, okay. But I don't know that it's necessary to put the rest of it. Yeah, I think we need to be consistent, whatever. Yeah. If things happen in the executive minutes or an executive session, I don't think we want them here if we're going to be consistent. Right. Right. I think. I mean, we have to. We have to let the public know what we're talking about in executive session, um, in case it does um, involve them and they want to attend. But we don't have to give um, detail. detailed information about that. So what? So let me ask: What needs to be changed about these minutes before we can approve them? Um, so these would just need to be um, the removal of the vote, as well as I personally would like to see the names removed, the bullet points. Okay. Um, so because because we're just approving exemptions, uh, personal exemptions in executive session, um, okay. and then the discussed chapter land for WD Coles is okay, um, because that was something that we were talking about. We were also asking that um, Richard come in to sign those particular things, so that's okay for the public to know that. Um, so let me so let me ask you this: what 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 is the public entitled to know who gets public the personal exemptions? Yes. So they can request, um, if so so interested, they can request a list of uh, properties and the amount of money that was received in exemptions. And who? Well, they, they could find out who the property belongs. Yeah, um, depending on the list that's given, it may say the owner's name, it may say the address. Okay, 
So um, I'm so trying we, to figure out. Uh, we shouldn't list the names ever because they're, they're supposed to request those, right? And That's we don't. Really, we still don't give out the names. We just give out the property. Okay, so we're we're talking about these in open session now. Um, uh, but we're very vaguely talking about them, though, um, whereas specifics are, you know, people's financials for the um, 41 applications, the uh, 17 applications, those things cannot be discussed in public session. Okay. So, so I'd rather just keep so, all the names off this stuff. I agree. I would like to see it that way, but that's that's your decision as the board. Okay. So you so you're saying in, in in the public minutes that the names wouldn't be there, but in the executive session minutes, uh, that's where the so, details would uh, be. That's correct. 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 So, I'm not sure what this, this is. so in terms of how we fix this minutes. <laughs> so in terms of these minutes, the first thing we would do is take where it says executive session entered at twelve thirteen p.m. and move that beneath. Okay, exactly right above where it says meeting adjourned. Okay. Um, and we would, we can leave the, the chapter land alone or we can say discuss chapter land and Richard to stop in to sign certificates. Either way is okay, um, up to you guys. And then under the approved personal exemptions, we'd leave it at that. And take the names off. Yes, and the vote. Okay, yes. and what about the vote that we took on, on Cole's? And that Cole. again would go into the executive session um, right, so minutes. So I'm sorry, our approval of chapter land for Coles is, is a executive session matter? Yes. Including including the result of the vote? Yes. Oh. Now, the other thing too is uh, if someone is to want a copy of the executive session minutes, they are able to get those, assuming that all matters in executive session have been, um, um, ha have been completed and that there is no financial information on that paperwork. So we can redact if we had put that information. Um, and if we had left it, for example, where it says the approved personal exemptions for these people um, with our vote, that's okay to give out as well, if that's requested. We don't have to um, if no one has requested it, but if someone requests it, we can give that information. Okay, so related would be, I don't remember us ever approving executive session minutes and we don't I, have to no in fact i don't no. remember ever seeing executive session minutes i agree i think generally the executive session minutes are not approved only because of the fact that they're executive and we don't do it in the public section um but completely up to you guys if you would like to approve them in executive session we can certainly make an agenda item to do that yeah, I, I guess I'm fine with trusting you that the minutes reflect it. I mean, it's, my, my it's only really concern, hard if we're my not in person. Yeah. My, yeah, my only concern would be remembering what we did in executive session, <laughs> for example. <laughs> the, you know, well, if we, that's if a good we point. Could, yeah. yeah, if we could see them, for example, we would know that the vote was taken on, 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 on the Coles situation. So okay. I'm saying, yeah, yeah. If, if I we think we can figure out a way to do that. Okay. Well, we could come by your office and just read, look through them. I mean, you could do that as well. We can always send a totally separate. Well, I don't know that we would want to send the yeah, document right. depending yeah. on the if there's financial information in it, but I can always share a screen that shows it um, during our executive session. Yeah, I, I'm, yeah, I'd like that. So I'm, I'm, I, I don't have a problem with the personal exemptions being kept uh, uh, off our minutes. I'm just a little. Uh, unclear about why the chapter land uh, decisions. I mean, it seems to me a, 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 a voter or a taxpayer or a resident should be can come in and, and simply uh, get the information as to, as to what owners have been granted chapter land status, right? Yeah, yep. So that's a public thing, right? Yep. I mean, I I, this was only just the way that it was done, I think, in the past, and that's why I kept it that way. But I'm more than happy to move that into um, public section in the future. I'm fine with that too. Let's just vote. Let's not go to an executive session then in the future. 
to talk about chapter. Yeah, that's just, that's I fine with me. I don't me. think it's a. I don't think it's an executive session matter, but that's just a general sense. I think the the only way that it would be at that point is if we end up talking financials for someone, um, and then yeah. that of course would be executive yeah. session. Okay. But I think it's okay to to put it into public. So, the so let's leave. Okay. Go ahead. I mean, the chair is confused as to uh, what we need to do now. <laughs> okay. To, um, so, so what we'll do is we'll um, motion and second to approve the December 8th, 2021 meeting minutes with friendly amendments. And those amendments will be to move the line that states executive session entered in at 12, 13 p.m to just above the sentence that reads adjourned meeting at 12.35 p.m. We will remove um, the wording for W.D. Coles and Richard to be, for W.D. Coles, and we will remove the vote and the um, taxpayers' names on the approved personal exemptions. Does that okay. make sense? No. I can also do this. We can remove that, 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 and that. And then we will move this here. You're good. Yeah. <laughs> she likes coloring. I do, I do. I'm a kid okay. at heart. <laughs> okay, so can I move to subject to those changes, approve the minutes of, of the December meeting? Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. Okay. All right. So we can move on with all the minutes being approved to the abatements. Um, so we have the excise tax abatements for weeks of <laughs> December 2nd through December 17th in the amount of $403.93. Move to approve those abatements. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Okay. Then we have the following week, December 20th through December 28th with another uh, excise abatements in the amount of $291.99. Okay, move to approve those abatements. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 I don't aye. hear the vote. I didn't hear the vote there. Did everybody vote aye. yes on that? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Okay, um, so next we have the report for all the exemptions that were approved. Um, I'm just gonna quickly scroll through this since you all have a copy of it. So we just need your um, vote to approve. Uh, well, I guess we don't really need a vote, do we, Teresa? Because these are abatements they've already approved. Have we approved all these? You have. Yes. Some of these like blind, I've never approved a blind one. These are all the exemptions we have every year, the reoccurring ones. These are the statutory, the personal exemptions. Personal okay. exemptions. So let me just say, um, uh, you know, Kim, uh, we're perfectly, uh, we're perfectly uh, willing to be reformed. Uh, oh yeah. But we, um, I don't know that we've ever seen this summary before. And I think it's great that we can see it now. Um, mm -hmm. You probably, um, Richard, you probably saw the last, um, I think before I was sit, putting on there the um, signature page first, and I usually would put the um, the list afterwards, and I was requested to put the signature page on the back. Okay. okay. I, mean, I, I, looked at, I looked at this um, earlier today, and I saw names I haven't seen before, um, and I'm, I, I guess, um, is this in its current form subject to our approval or are we simply just looking at it for interest sake? Well, these are all the abatements that were approved on the, uh, uh, what, that back in De November or December, I think it was uh, meeting. I need, I need to be clarified on which ones do we actually look at and which ones are automatic. Yeah. Again, we've never approved anybody for a blind exemption. Okay. So the way so. Amherst does it is slightly different than the way I um, was taught to do it at assessor's school. 
Um, in assessor's school, everyone applies for those particular, the personal exemptions every year, and the board needs to review those applications every year. Um, I, I don't think that Amherst does it that way. Um, so if you guys would like to change that to the way that I know, that's okay. Um, but it's up to you. I heard the term statutory exemption. What is Same that? thing as personal exemption. The state calls them, I think, statutory exemption, or at least that's that's how I recognized them. Um, maybe an old term that's used in um, assessing classes, but personal exemptions is the same. Well, so what you're saying, Amherst does it, if it's been approved once and they renew it year after year, we don't have to approve it again. Correct. Uh, it, the, off, the, the assessor's office, so Teresa, myself, um, Stephen, will look through them and make sure that the requirements are still met. Okay. But it appears that you don't see them again once they've been I'm, approved the first time. Yeah, unless, unless there's, a, unless there's a change in yeah, there. I'm fine with that. So do we, see them, do we see them the first time they apply? Correct. Okay. And then and thereafter, then if there's any sort of change of, for example, someone going from a $1,000 exemption to a 175 or vice versa. I'm fine if, with that. Yeah, if they miss a year. Then you'd see them again. Then we'll yeah, see them you'd, again. You'd see them yeah. again, right. And they'd okay. start over at the beginning. Okay. So is there a signature on this document that has to be approved? Yes. No, I, I don't think we want to sign it here. We sign on the applications as they come yeah, in. You, yeah, I mean. It, hmm. We have to oh, sign again then? There's a signature line right no, I there. Think, you know what? I think that this was brought up um, in the previous where, and I probably ended up scanning these just as a automatic thing. So I think I was told previously that I really don't need to, as long as you've um, approved the exemptions, you really didn't need to see the reports. So. I don't personally think that this needs to be signed because you've approved the other abate, the actual yeah. abatement application. But again, this was something that was different for me. So some I of those. Some of those abatements happened long before us, we were on the board, if they're being renewed every year. So, oh, so yeah. that, is yeah. the, that right there is the grand total of all uh, personal, uh, pers the sort of personal abatements that we do, veterans, blind, um, veteran spouse. That, that right there is the number 101,500. Right, for the, one, for the ones that were processed and that we had received at that point, yes. At, at that point, me right. Sometimes we get some. I mean, these were done before the tax bills um, were generated, so they would okay. reflect on the tax bill. So we do. We have up until April first to to receive these applications. So um, anybody new, um, obviously, um, we wouldn't. Or if anybody sent in theirs late, um, we would do the adjustments. Um, okay. Once now, we get I their had application. A my, I got my tax bill this year and I saw, I thought there was some very good um, information uh, that, that accompanied that tax bill. Is that new, that new, that information that we got? Yes, yes. Okay. And that's I something that I have in the future on the agenda in, to talk about too, so. Yeah, yeah, we said we wanted to, the, to address the notification of exemption process. And this is I one thing- I thought it was really good. Did. Yeah, yep. me too. And your message was good, Kim. Introducing Thank you. Your... Yeah. Thank you. Good. It was a it was a user friendly mailing from the town. I thought. Yeah. yeah. And we learned about parking too, right? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. So where where does this report go to? Who get, who do you send this to? Anybody? I'm sorry. Yeah. The, we're talking this about report, this abatement. This hundred one thousand five hundred. Who's this go to? Anybody? We okay. I give copies on to the collector's office and but, accounting department. But have they already done the adjustments or not? We do the adjustments over there here. So, so we've put them into Munis as of twelve sixteen. There was okay. one hundred and one thousand five hundred and forty okay. cents, so um, and then straight. it sounds like Teresa just gives a copy of this report to them so that they okay. they're aware of that as well. So okay. it goes to the. It goes to the state. No, it goes to um, the collector's office and the accounting office. Okay. okay. But it does then, actually in in April after we have our deadline of um, final, you know, no longer being able to turn in the statutory or the uh, personal exemptions, 
we do have a, a recording that we set up with the state to let them know how many of each category we have. And we do get refunded for um, X amount of dollars, depending on how many abatements we have. Okay, yeah. so there's some sort of a state subsidy of these, yes. right? Yes. Okay. That's right. Yeah. Okay, well, we will move along. This is just another list of those that must have come in on the 20th rather than the 16th. Um, so the next thing on. Just a, a, a brief comment on the agenda. These personal abatement reports were not mentioned at all on the agenda. I don't know if they need to be, but. Um, at this point, no, because we're not taking a vote. If there was a vote, okay. yes, we would certainly need to. Um, Good. To ch change that. So, okay. So the next thing on the list is the commitment to for the actual tax billing. Um, so we have this page here as the warrant to the collector states that we are expecting to collect $56,867,171.09 in real estate tax alone. Um, second, oh, is there no page to accounting? That comes at later. The, that's oh, okay. all done on one sheet. So that you'll see that later on. Okay, right okay. Now. Is that so the whole so levy? same information is going to be submitted to the um, accounting office that you will see um, further down in the attachments. But and, um, what was that, the question? Is that the whole levy? For um, it could property? it could be. Um, it depends on how the uh, town would like to use that. You're allotted a specific number to for your levy. Uh, whether or not you actually collect up to that penny or less than that um, depends on the needs of the community as well as um, you know a, a number of other factors. I believe this is less than the amount that we're actually able to um, collect for this year. And that really? number and that number agrees with the LA five. That's correct. So this is this is absolute. This is under the two and a half percent increase plus the new growth. Cap. Generally speaking, you're allowed to, well, you're allowed to go um, up to two and a half percent on your um, real estate taxes each year. Um, generally speaking, I think many communities choose to not use that full two and a half percent, especially if there's not a requirement to spend that amount of money there, you know, there's not, not a need for all of that. Okay. And then special requirements if we have to go override. Mm -hmm. That's correct. That's correct. And um, if, if this is something that you're more interested in and you want some more information, we can certainly schedule Sean to come in um, at our next meeting and sort of talk through this with us. Um, you know, I don't I don't want to speak too in depth because this is more of the accounting side of things okay. um, to figure out that that, you know, exactly how much we we need to collect. Um, so, you know, I don't want to get too in depth with it and give you false information. All right. But it but requires if it is, our signature, correct? Yes. Uh, the, the LA5, yes. The LA5 requires your signature. That's correct. Okay. And is there a separate, um, is there a separate one of these for the CPA surcharge? Yes. Yep. We will get to that um, as we continue. I just figured we would do one at a time since it's something different. Yes. Um, sure. So if you are comfortable um, to vote on the actual tax, we can do that now, or we can go through each one and vote on them separately once we get no, to I the end. I think we can do this one. I move to approve um, this warrant uh, for the amount shown there. Um, Second. All, um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. okay. So moving along to the next one, it happens to be the CPA. So um, here is the warrant to the collector in the amount of $1,314,378.50. Um, so this is what we expect to collect with the CPA tax for the fiscal year 2022. Okay. Um, I, I, sometimes it gets referred to as a surcharge, I think. Yes. Um, um, I move to approve this amount uh, on the warrant for the CPA tax. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, uh, moving along next, we will see the water and sewer uh, commitment for liens and interest. Um, and this is the warrant to the collector. 
Um, so I had split that out, I think, on my notes, but um, total amount to be collected is 287,998 and 48 cents. And okay. that's both water and sewer, including the interest. So I'm, uh, it's amazing how I can be in like my sixth year of doing this and I still don't yeah, understand I stuff, but. Um, <laughs> Let so me how, show you the next. Um, how does so this, this get, how does this amount get collected? So these get leaned to the real estate tax bill. So the CPA charge gets applied to the real estate tax bill, as well as the water and sewer and the interest for both of those. So if you see this report that I have up on the screen right now, this is right straight out of Munis, which is the billing system. Yeah. And it shows you the total for each of those, which is where we're getting our numbers from on the commitments. Um, so then it shows you that for the specifically the sewer and water interest in liens, there aren't any for the first and second quarters because we put them on the third and fourth quarters. Um, so you'll see those reflected in those two statements there. Um, going down just another page, just to make things slightly easier and a broken down figure. This is the commitment to, or the, um, the, yes, the commitment to the accounting office. And you will see the actual breakdown. So you see the 56 million in real estate, um, the 2 million in personal property. Then you'll see the breakdown of the sewer assessment here. So this number here is the amount of sewer bills that was not collected on time. Um, so it was leaned to the real estate tax bill to make that collection. And then this 12, um, this has an extra number here. This three um, needs to be removed. So we will do that as well. But so it's $12,274.72 is the interest on that 128,000 that was not collected. Okay. And so, then going, go ahead. So I'm just going to ask, um, and since I'm the only one asking questions, I have a sense my, my two brothers um, uh, are, are fully on top of this, but um, <laughs> I take it that these are, these, the, these are assessments that are, that go on someone's person, uh, property real estate bill when they, they haven't paid their sewer water sewer on time. Is that right? That's correct. I think it's there's a certain days. amount of uh, there's a certain amount of years back that they go. I believe the collector the collector makes that determination as to what years get leaned to the tax bills. Um, Anything so, over ninety days gets leaned to the property once the actuals come. Okay. Oh, okay. So, so if it's late past that. Um, that's when they do that. So some um, people see this on their bill and others do not. Is that right? That's, that's correct. Um, okay. If you have not paid your water and sewer bills, then you would see this if it's past 90 days due. Um, if you have paid those bills on time, then you will not see these extra charges. So this is just the information. Um, sorry, this is dollar amount that has not yet been collected. Okay. Um, and then you'll see the exact same thing down here for um, the water interest and assessment. So the water balance is $134,427.60 that has not been paid. And then that 13,000 is the interest on that number. Um, and then again, you'll see the CPA tax as well. So those are all the things that we're asking you to vote on. We are committing to the collector and the accountant for uh, because it was leaned to the real estate tax bills. Yeah, I, I was wondering why we would see the water and sewer in, uh, at all, but and because... the and the reason being is because it was leaned to the tax yes, bill. Yes, got it now. Okay, yes. got it. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Any idea what the interest is for the they charge on the past two payments? The they show um, right I... there. Don't know what the percentage no, is on percentage. water and sewer. Oh, Teresa, percentage? do you happen to know what know. the percentage is? I actually right. don't. That's all right. That's so fine. these are not amounts that are calculated in the assessor's office. They're passed along from um, accounting. Departments. Accounting, yeah, okay. From the collector, yeah. When, collector. when we do the input of the tax bills, there's a place where the collector takes over and applies these to the tax bills. Okay. Yes. So yeah, we, we have a signature line to approve on this. So we have um, we we need to do each one separately. So we have personal property commit. We already did the real estate. Um, so we have personal property in the amount of um, two million three hundred thirty eight dollars 
um, two million three hundred thirty eight eight sixty six and thirty three cents that needs approval. And again, that's for personal property. Do you want to move that up on the screen? Yeah. Kim? Sorry about that. Is that that's down here? Yeah. Okay. Uh, move to approve that uh, that warrant for personal property tax. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. Then I will move back up here to just show you these amounts. So we have the sewer, which is here. So we're gonna vote on that. So um, the actual sewer bills is $128,289.54 with the interest in the amount of $12,274.72. You've, You've got a number out of place there. Yes, right. so we will correct that as well. The three is going out? Yes. Okay. Yep. So again, it should be $12,274.72. Okay. Do we have to approve those numbers too? Yes. Okay. All right. I vote to um, to uh, approve the warrant for the sewer assessment plus interest. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, and then the last one is the one circled on the bottom, which is just the water and the water interest. Um, so again, water is one hundred and thirty four thousand four hundred and twenty seven and sixty cents. And then the interest on that is thirteen thousand six dollars and sixty two cents. Move to approve the, uh, the warrant for those. Second. For water. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. Perfect. All right, so uh, moving on, we had had a discussion in the past about, um, oh, this is just the report out of Munis to show you where we got our numbers from. Okay. Um, so we had had a discussion in last meeting about uh, chapter properties and there was interest in finding out how many properties were actually listed in, uh, were enrolled in chapter programs. So we printed out the LA4 um, from this year for you to show you um, the, the particular chapter categories and how many parcels are listed. So under chapter 61A, which is the first one, or um, excuse me, under chapter 61, which is the first one highlighted, you will see a category that says two and then a line that says 34. So, excuse me, 34 means that there are 34 parcels that are strictly chapter 61 and there are two other parcels that have other uses as well as chapter 61. So it could be someone's residence um, and then their backyard is being, um, is under a forest management plan, something to that nature. Um, next line down, you will see chapter 61A, same idea. So there is 74 properties in the town of Amherst that are strictly chapter 61 farming of some sort. And there are six of them that are listed as mixed use. So meaning, um, again, could be someone's residence and there's also a farm on the property as well. Okay. And then the, the last category is chapter 61B, recreational. Um, so there are 18 parcels that are strictly recreational land being left at its natural state, allowing others to use the property for um, trail access, hiking, things to that nature. And there is one that is uh, someone's residence as well as, or, or I think it's probably someone's residence as well as that. And the 61Bs, are those generally trails? Uh, people with, with uh, provided sort of a right of way across their property? Um, it can trail. be trails. It can be, um, you know, if you have, basically, if you're leaving your land at its natural state and you're not touching it, um, you're allowing other people to use it. There's generally speaking, there's a trail on it. Um, it Maybe that the back of your house is, or the back of your yard is the side of a mountain and you allow people to create their own trails and travel up the mountain. Um, you know, it can be something to that nature. Um, it can be that you have a pond in your backyard and you allow people to go back there and, you know, use the space to hang out, to fish, to, to hike, to, you know, whatever. Um, so as long as it's being left at its natural state and you're allowing others to use it, you can be enrolled and you have enough acreage that is, you can be enrolled in 61B. And the amounts to the right of those three lines, what do those represent? The amounts to the right is the value of the, each of those. Those are all given to us by the state, the values? These, these all come out of our system, our uh, vision. 
Um, and then we provide them to the state and the state does their research to approve or tell us that we need to make any adjustments on these. Oh, I thought the state sort of told us that's going to be the value. So the state does give us um, guidelines as to how to value these these particular okay. properties. Um, you know, when we put a code on a property, so you see on the chapter 61, there's a 600 in parentheses. That's the land use code. So if you're to look at a property and you see that it says 600, you can know that that means that property is is has a forest management plan. Um, so under that condition, yes, the state does give specific guidelines and requirements as to how to um, set up those values. And that's generally done through the um, CAMA system. So in our case, vision. So Ken, this was your inquiry. So do you have any no. questions about this or? Well, I guess along that same line then, so you think 61A, you get more strong state input on the value where yes. the other two, you're more free to do what you want to do? Um, no, not necessarily. I mean, we have, so with, with chapter 61A, which is in the middle of the 700s, yep. so that is the farming, that's like, um, you know, hay fields, vegetables, so on and so forth. Um, and so every year we have a chart that's given to us by the state calculated out to our specific area. So you'll see something like um, west side of the, of the river is this dollar amount per square foot on this type of property you know, north side of the river is this. So, so they come oh, out, okay. they do their research and figure out, you know, which side of the river is, is, you know, more valuable land than the other side. Um, and so then they give that to us and, you know, it's our choice whether or not we want to update that. I think personally, it's, it's a good idea to follow along with every year with what they're suggesting just yep. to keep, keep with market values. So it normally goes up if it, it doesn't go down ever. It does. Yep. It does. Um, <laughs> If there's ever a situation where, um, for example, a flood has happened and it's happened over and over and over and over again in oh. the same year, and it's really affected the land and they don't anticipate that the, the land is going to dry out in any time soon, that would certainly affect, um, you know, the land on whatever side of the river that they're talking about. Um, maybe it affects both sides in that case. Um, you know, maybe there's some sort of issue with, um, you know, corn for some, for example, and um, right here in Massachusetts, in Western Mass, maybe that's our specialty. Maybe that's the thing we grow, um, mm. and we ship that throughout, you know, the United States. If there's an issue with that, it may affect the value of these lands, depending on how the state looks at it. So it's really you know, I can't say exactly what they're looking at because I don't know, um, no. but those are like sort of the gist of what they look at. And recreation, do they give you a guideline on that to them? Uh, that's like usually about 25%, uh, 75%, I believe of the, of the, but yes, guidelines come from, from the state. Yes. Okay. And you mentioned minimum sizes. Do these all different chapters have different minimum sizes? That's correct. So um, chapter 61B is a minimum of five acres. And then uh, 61A and 61 is a minimum of 10. Okay. So um, I just had a question this morning about someone removing land from, from a chapter. Um, and basically the answer is, if you want to keep farming, you can move, remove as much as you want, as long as you have that minimum requirement um, to be in chapter. And then of course, there's other other um, things that go along with that, the rollback tax, the liens that are applied um, with this. So there's you know much more to that, but. Sure. So th this is very interesting chart. I mean, what is 12 to 43 categories? What are the, at the very bottom on the chart? Um, so that's our mixed use properties. So the mixed use codes um, are, so they, they separate out the ones, the mixed use properties that are specifically involved with chapter programs, and then they put everything else together. So mixed use is anything that is, um, for example, residence and a storefront. Uh, maybe it's a, um, a commercial building and an industrial building. Um, you know, it's a number of things, but those basically what it's picking up there is any type of mixed use property. So the zero in front of the 12, represents that it's mixed use in Where are we that looking? case i'm sorry 
where are we looking? I, I'm trying to follow. The second, right, right, second to last line, right above the 900 figure. Yep. So, so the oh, zero right. represents the fact that it's a mixed use. In the case of the zero one, uh, let's let's say the case of the zero four three, because um, we uh, the reason that I'm skipping over is because we don't have um, any two hundred properties, which is open space. So, uh, zero four three would mean okay, it's mixed use. The four represents that it's industrial property, and the three represents that it's a commercial property. Okay. Um, so, in the case of Chapter 61, you would see a 071, meaning zero, it's a mixed use. One, uh, seven, meaning it's a chapter land property and the majority of the property is being farmed. And then the one represents the residential part being second in the, or third in the list of numbers means that it's the smallest amount of the land that's being used for the residents. So there's, there's these are quite complicated if you really think about it. Yes. <laughs> you just said the chapters have their own unique mixed use. Yes. So they it's set up right. exactly the same way. It starts with a zero. Got it. Oh. All mixed use properties, the very first number after the zero is the main use of the property. And then going further away, it'll be the, the lesser and lesser use of the property. Okay. But the state, for some reason, separates um, chapter mixed use property versus um, you know, commercial industrial or residence commercial, residence industrial. Um, not sure exactly what the reason is, but that's what they do. And the last question I had on this chart is, does the exact, exempt property, that 900 line, is that number ever used for anything? I mean, is it really up to date or is it just sort of once in a done while nope. you're looking? No, it's up to date. So, um, any property that is exempt uh, with the state, with the with the exception of state-owned properties, um, needs to file a three ABC every year, which basically explains to their community why they are exempt and that they were approved by the state of Massachusetts. So there's certain paperwork that they need to accompany that application with, um, but that that number is updated yearly. So if someone doesn't file their three ABC this year. And we reach out to them to say, hey, we didn't get your application and they never respond or they say to us, you know what, we've moved out of Amherst. We don't own that building anymore. Um, that number would reflect that. And then also if someone moves into Amherst and has the, the um, files to 3ABC and they're new to our town, then that would also change. But part of that form, they list how, what it's worth? Nope. They list, um, they basically in that form, they're just proving to us that the state has uh, oh, okay. approved their exempt status. We still value those exactly the same way that we would value any other property. Um, so you still have to do all the work and we're not collecting any taxes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yes. I mean, that's gotta be a ton of work with UMass <laughs> and Amherst and. Yes. Uh, wow. Yes. And they're strange buildings too, to value. Yes. Wow. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much for sharing this, Kim. No problem. Um, so the next thing on the agenda is the principal assessor update. Um, at the moment, I don't have a whole lot to update you on. Um, and basically, um, so what I wanna tell you is obviously, as you know, the tax bills have gone out. Um, we sent out that um, um, letter in the tax bills. So. Um, that went through a whole process of approval um, with the town manager and the other departments as well. Um, we've gotten really good feedback on that. Um, so that's been really nice to hear that people are um, actually reading it because there's always fear when you send something out in the tax bills, it just gets dumped in the recycling bin. Um, so it was really nice to hear that, that people are actually reading that. Um, so that's what's going on. We are preparing our system for the new fiscal year. So we're getting ready to work on um, lot splits and any significant changes that needs to happen. Um, waiting on the building department to get us a list of any occupancy permits that were given so we can process some supplemental bills if needed. Um, looking at some overvaluations, we haven't gotten a ton yet, uh, which is good. We're still early though. Um, so just kind of prepping up for those things. And, um, we do have a pretty busy year ahead of us cause we've got the, um, 
the reval happening and our cyclicals are due for the state as well. Um, so just really, what do you mean by cyclicals? So cyclical inspections are, um, something the state requires. And what it is, is every single property has its own unique schedule. So when you enter someone's residence building, whatever it is that you're going into, you start a 10 year frame. So the state requires that we attempt to inspect every single parcel um, building in the, in the town that you are in every 10 years. Um, at least you can do it more than that if, if so needed. Um, and so every, um, every 10 years, we have to provide them proof with records that we have actually done a portion of our community. Um, generally speaking, assessors will try to wait until the last couple of years to do those inspections um, because it's the most accurate data. Um, and so when the state comes in to look at those, they, they see that that's, that's what's happened and they're okay with that. Uh, so that is due for us this year. So this is our 10th year of the state cycle. And so we're trying to um, meet all those requirements for those properties that are at their 10 year mark or over. The thing that stinks about this is everybody has the right to tell us that we can't come in. So there are some properties that, um, you know, what, the best that we can do is send notification and ask to enter. Um, and if they say no, then we have to find other ways to, um, to look at their valuation and, and try not to overtax them and try not to undertax them. So um, that's, that's one kind of yucky part about this. <laughs> This happens every year though, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. We every do inspections years. every year, but, yeah, but, but every 10 years, the state comes in to, to verify that we're actually doing what we're supposed to be. Oh, doing. okay. So yeah. the state doesn't bother you except for every 10 years. That's, That's the only correct. Time state checks. Okay. Yep. Yep. And if we don't have all that stuff done, of course, then they, you know, um, they come in and either take over and do it for us, depending on how bad in, you know, what, what shape we're in and how long things have been put out, put aside um, and then they charge us for that at, at whatever cost, regardless of if we have that in our budget. So we want to keep on top of that. It also just helps us to keep our values accurate. So we want to do that anyway. Um, Are so you yes. in shape or do you need to hire some help? Um, so we'll need to hire some help, but that's a normal thing. No. Um, but, but I think by the sounds of it, we're in pretty good shape. Good. Yeah. So... Um, so that's really what I've got for the um, update for the moment. Those are the most important things, I think. Um, there's, you know, I mean, of course, you know, there's daily operations that we're continuing to do. Um, Teresa has mailed out and, and Stephen all of the um, income and expense, three ABCs, for personal property form of lists. Um, so, so we're getting a lot of those back as well. Um, as any of you may heard, we did send out a postcard reminder for the income and expense forms, um, and we put them on our website. So if anybody's looking to get those, they are available there. And of course, if you know if somebody needs them mailed, we can we can do that or email. Um, so we've gotten quite a few calls about you know what the heck is this? I've never seen this before. Um, but it just saved us money. It saved us time, um, and, it, and it seems like a lot more people are willing to actually do things on the computer nowadays. So. Um, why not take advantage of that and just save the town some money on postage, on paper, on time of all of us having to stuff the envelopes and, you know, all of that stuff. So that was just a little cost saver for us. So, um, but I think at the, other than the, those things, um, that's kind of what, what we're doing right now. You send it out, things out to the farm every so often to verify their income from farms. Yes. So every October there's an application for um, each class of 61 um, with 60 with chapter 61 uh, recreational um, forest management plans they have um, a requirement every 10 years to renew their their plan so they don't have to necessarily file an application with us each year um, but but if you're in chapter 61a without a forest management plan and you're in chapter 61b it is a requirement of the state that you supply that information to your community yearly okay uh, any update on the residential exemption? Oh, yes. Um, so I have reached out to um, all those communities that we had suggested. I added in, I think it was Waltham that you guys had suggested that I talk to. Um, or Somerville, Somerville. And I've heard back from most of them. Um, 
and I'm hearing a very negative response. Um, so uh, what I'd like to do actually, maybe if you guys are interested is um, at our next meeting, I can share with you my results and what I have written down so far. And we can, we can put discussion on that if that's okay. Neg negative response about the viability of a residential exemption. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, basically, um, you know, it's, it, it, what I'm hearing is it causes a ton of work for the assessor's office to the point of potentially having, having to hire another staff member. Um, it causes for one community was saying very negative things that it causes for people to lie to you and saying that they live in a place where they actually don't live it causes for um, just hostility between neighbors um, so these are people, these are communities that have actually instituted a residential exemption. That's correct. Oh, um, another thing that I'm hearing that is, is concerning is that once you're in it, you're stuck. You can't take it away. How can you take away an exemption for people who need it? Um, another really concerning factor that I have, um, been, that has been mentioned to me is the fact that anybody that has a trust does not qualify. And that's very concerning because a lot of elderly people put their property in a trust um, or they have um, gifted their, their residence to their children with a life estate and, and that affects this. So if those are the people that we're trying to help, this is not gonna help them at all. Um, so, you know, I think there's a lot more research that needs to get done and I think that um, we are, Sean and I have been working on a, um, trying to just collect all this data and first process everything. We've been reaching out to some of our own property owners. Um, I was able to speak with um, someone the other day who owns a, a number of large uh, apartment complexes in, in town um, and just sort of heard his side of things. Um, and it's eye-opening to think about from his direction. So I think uh, we'll, we'll, we'll be putting together a presentation for the, for the council at some point. Um, and, you know, sort of see where it goes from there. Maybe this is, this is enough information and they don't want to be bothered by this anymore. Maybe they want to find out more, maybe, you know, so we kind of have to wait at this point, um, continue the data collection and just wait to see what the council is looking for. Right. So this is easily more complicated than it even, it, it, the more you look at it, the more complicated it gets. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, it's, it's, okay. You look at the outside and you say, okay, this, this looks great, but, but you really, I mean, this research is great because you're finding out a lot of things. Also finding out that if you implement this, you have to keep it for a minimum of three years, unless there's huge, huge detriment to your community and it's causing a huge issue, then you have to bring it to Capitol Hill and you have to go through this huge process to remove it. But then you also have the factor of, okay, you've given the elderly people or the, the residents who are full-time in this community, this break, and now you're taking it away from them. How does that feel? So it's a huge, um, it's a huge decision to, to do this or not. Well, it sounds like it could just have gone simpler. I mean, if you look <laughs> at the, you look at the pluses and minuses and uh, it could be very simple for council and everybody else. Right. And so hopefully that's what this research is going to bring is a plus and minuses chart that we bring to the council and then they can see and make their decision based on that. Kim, is there, a, is there a goal to have it, the presentation ready, completed? Um, Sean and I are going to sit down possibly today. I, I, I'm not sure if that was set in stone yet, um, but we wanted to look at a couple of things um, together and hopefully have enough information to be able to present by the end of the month and then see what council wants to do with it. Um, well, I from, mean, I think, I think part of the, one of the considerations is when does the council have any sort of uh, running room for you to, to actually um, present something when they're not thinking about five, five, you know, 10 other things. Right, so, right. Yeah. So yeah, so I, I mean- I'm guessing the summertime sometime, right? Having the presentation ready now um, or soon is ideal. And then trying to squeeze into their schedule is, yes. is another whole thing. But also keeping in mind that we wanna give a significant amount of time to be able to figure out if they wanna vote this in, how we need to implement this, how we need to get this done. Do we need to hire someone else? Do we, you know, so on and so forth. So. Um, if, we, if this isn't something that we can sort out, I would say by the summertime, um, 
this might be something we want to push push back another year. Yeah, you know, you don't want to push, but you want to get it done early. I mean, you can squeeze it somewhere in there with a council. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, it might be difficult year. at this moment because I know this time of year is busy for them too. But yeah, if we can get in in never. February or March, you know, I think I think the earlier the better. Yeah. So is it your sense that it's become sort of the sort of the shorthand conventional wisdom in most communities, which is especially in Western Massachusetts, which is we can't we can't do this or we shouldn't do this. It's almost sort of a standard. They have to decide about this every year, right? So yes. most communities sort of have have it baked in that they they can't do this, right? Yeah. Uh, well, I I wouldn't say that uh, it's it's that they can't do it. It's that we don't want to do it. Um, right. okay. I also was given a fantastic PowerPoint presentation by the city of Barnstable um, really? explaining this information. So I'd be happy to share that with you all as well. I'd like um, to just, do that. Just yeah, explaining how, how the, this works. And, and they went very specifically and did uh, a breakdown of taxes in their own community. So this, you know, this, this, that I have the PowerPoint that I have is not for Amherst, it's for Barnstable. So the numbers they, might look funny, but they, at least you can see, you know, how it's working there. They had, um, so they have it, right? They do have it. And what I'm what I'm getting the census of is all of these communities that I've reached out to that have gotten back to me have had this in place for over 20 or 30 years. Mm -hmm. And the new assessors are, um, you know, like the guy in Barnstable said, this has been here for over 30 years. And we have the staff, we've had the staff to be able to do it. So it's not really a big deal. But a community that's starting out, this is a big deal because you're not only, you know, exempting X amount of dollars from these people and having these people pay for it, but you're also having to add another staff member. You're having more calls to the office. You're having, you know, more paperwork that needs to be filled out. You're having to monitor things more closely. You're having the risk of people telling you that they live there and they don't, you know, you're, so there's just all these things that, um, you know, we need to think about. So there's been a, some, so, so people have a tendency to fudge a little bit about. <laughs> uh, yeah. And I mean, the thing is like, you know, of course that's going to happen in every scenario, in every situation, in every budget item, in every, you know what I mean? It's going to happen. But if you're trying to help the people who live here, the seniors, the people who just, this is their residence, this is where they grew up, this is where they want to bring their family, stuff like that is not going to help. So people need to be honest. And we, I mean, you know, it's, it's the 21st century. <laughs> So, um, but anyway, that's just feedback that I've gotten so far. That's what I take of it. And so what I would like to do is put this as a, um, an item on our agenda for our next meeting. And I can um, share that presentation with you and I can share our findings. That'd be good. When's the next meeting? Um, oh, are we at the point where we have to, uh, get, are we done with all the topics today? I think so. As long as you guys are comfortable with that. we have an executive session today, Kim? We do. Yes. Very, very short, but yes. Okay. Um, um, I'm suggesting February 9th. That's good. Do you, you want to stick with Wednesdays still? Yes. Second okay. Wednesday of the month. Okay. That looks good. 11 a.m. Sure. Gentlemen, is that good? Yeah, that's good. Okay. All right. Okay. So then um, we can uh, motion to uh, enter executive session. So can I bring up something? I got an email about conflict of interest from the clerk's office. Yes. And I'm wondering whether the other, um, Lee yeah. and Ken got, got it too. Right. Oh, and only you, only you. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, this was something that all, all employees got as well as board members now, um, and the council I'm, as well. I haven't looked at it carefully to figure out what I'm supposed to do. Can you give me sort of a short summary of what I'm supposed to do? Yes. So if in the past, I believe it was the past, if you took the, um, the, the, if you, if you listen to the, the seminar last year, then all you need to do is sign that certificate stating that you understand, um, you know, that there's the conflict of interest rights. Um, if you did not listen to that seminar last year, then you need to listen to that. It's just, a, it's just a webinar. Um, and Online. then you can sign that, um, that form. Do you guys have a, have a memory of doing this? Yes. Yeah, everybody did it on their own Zoom. Right. 
Hmm. It's, a, it's an online thing. You, you don't so remember if you, it, Richard? If I'm you sorry. don't remember it, I would be willing to bet that you'd need to listen to that. Yeah. You don't forget it for a while. I'm yeah. blanking out. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so I would say if you if you can just take a few minutes to um, do that webinar and then you can sign that and submit it back to the clerk and or me. It doesn't matter how you do it um, as long as we can get it to the clerk. Does the clerk's office have some record as to whether I affirmed that I saw it last year? Yeah, they yes. Were. Yeah, you can always touch base with them and find out if this is a year that you need to do that if you want. All right, because I'm having a must be having a senior moment here because I don't <laughs> I'm not remembering it. Well, you, last year you could have signed the form without looking at it, though. So, no, I'm not this sure is that. true. This is true. Last year, that. last year was a tough year, so we never know. Okay. <laughs> um, what's, the, what's the outlook on Zoom here? Um, as of right now, we're looking to keep it this way until at least April, and then we'll hear what the council okay. votes on. So, yeah. um, before we go into exec executive session two, I just want to mention that what we will be talking about is uh, the personal exemptions. Okay. Okay. So that's All right. In a minute, so, yeah. so um, and we're not returning. We're not going to return after executive session. That's correct. Okay. So I move that we. So I move that we go into executive session to Second. address personal exemptions. Right. Second. Okay. And since. Favor, oh, go ahead. Aye. 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 Okay. Since we're in there, I am going to stop the recording of the meeting. Thank you very much.